Welcome to the Troy Kearns Podcast. We talk all things real estate, business, and entrepreneurship. Today, I have a very special friend of mine, my CPA, and pretty much anybody in Las Vegas who wants to save money on taxes. He's a brilliant mind. He's a real estate investor. You're going to learn a ton. If you're investing in real estate right now and you're trying to figure out how do I make more money, well, eliminating your partner, the IRS, is one good way. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. Excited to be here. So, you know, I, I noticed that you... You haven't said anything about my hair. Well, it's it's actually caused me to be speechless. <laughs> right. Well, no. I don't know how you grew that so quickly. <laughs> I'm having a little fun. So, Mark, you 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 know, we've we've known each other a long time. I wanted to talk about that like Do you remember how we met? Yeah, actually one of um one of my uh clients that I had already had referred me um and you came into my office and you said I need some help. I keep getting these letters from the IRS and I need some help to straighten this stuff out. And I need someone who really knows what they're doing. And we came up with some great strategies and, and some good plans. And uh, it's been, you know, fairly quiet since then. Yeah. So to kind of expand on that. So what you guys know is I had a CPA, quote unquote, before Mark. I've actually had several of them. And we got audited in 2008 seven or eight and what happened was there was unreported income from a 1099 that i had received and i asked about five different accountants who i was interviewing because i realized i was starting to make some money i realized i needed to have a great accountant and i asked everybody the same question i said this is what happened to me what would you do differently so that this never happened to me again and mark goes well i just checked the irs's website against the 1099s <laughs> filed against you and yeah Nobody else gave me that answer, and he's given me answers before that I haven't listened to, and he's he's just a whiz with, how did you get into becoming a CPA? Went to college, normal you know procedures. I went to work for someone while I was in college, um, kind of changed my mind to do it. I was actually a pre-dent major when I first really? went to- Really? Yeah. I, I didn't was, know that, I don't think. Yeah, and then I hit chemistry, and that was just upsetting, and I decided <laughs> to change my protocol. So I liked math, and I was uh, kind of a natural. And I said, okay, let me, let me look at this, and I went into accounting. Uh, worked for a sole proprietorship. Guy was working out of his house, and he sits me down, and I'm sitting at this desk. It's like an architecture desk, and uh, he has this 10-key adding machine there, and he says, all right, are you left-handed or right-handed? And I said, well, I'm left-handed. He goes, put your right hand up there. I said, you got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> so, so I, you know, I put this thing up. He's got me adding all kinds of numbers because right. it's just before all computers came out, and uh and then uh, from there, I, I just, I really liked it. I liked working with numbers. I liked helping people. And uh, so then I got from that to, um, you know, I graduated college and I went to work for um, what's now called BDO, um, which used to be called Seedman and Seedman. And I uh, worked for them for four years and um, in, their, uh, in their auditing department and did tax returns as well. And then, uh, then I left, and that was in Los Angeles. Right. I was in I was in Los Angeles, and uh, I came here um, when I met my I, at the time my fiance. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we um, I moved her out, and then uh, I would work. I was working a little bit, and then I um, I came over and interviewed in Las Vegas, and uh, and uh, I got this job working as a controller for a sod farm and a nursery. Really. <laughs> And um, and I thought, you know what? Let me get some industry experience. Sod farm and nursery. Yeah, it yeah. was hilarious. It was literally right behind um, Sick Freedom Roy's uh, like Oasis office. Oh, Santa Rancho. Fe. Yes, right. exactly. Okay. And um, and so then I worked for them um, and uh, for a few years. So I think it was like three years. And then I went to work for a steel company. Right. And uh, I was area. Actually, yeah, it was called uh, Steel Engineers. Interesting right. company. And, Good uh, location too, right? Oh, quality area. Yeah, quality but... area. Wouldn't buy any rental real estate there, but yeah, definitely uh, interesting. <laughs> so for those of you guys who don't know, the reason that we're uh, referencing that is I actually owned a tow company <laughs> <laughs> past tense very soon, and we're going to find that out. Um, and it's probably i would call it the like corner of hell and lost dreams just that <laughs> general area there looks like zombies walking by and mark yeah. worked in a very rough area of town for a yes. big steel company yeah you didn't want to be there after like five o'clock when it got dark 
Yeah. Anyway, so I worked there for about um, five years, and then uh, I struck out on my own. I was doing, I was doing moonlighting at night. I basically worked there about ten hours during the day, and then after that, I um, I worked at home in my living room for about three years. Uh, just but that's building where your office practice. still was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really don't like over. <laughs> He's watching the bottom dollar here. <laughs> so um, so I did that, and then. Um, and then I moved into an office off of Jones for a few years and then finally ended up on uh, Rancho. And I've been there since February of 2003. All right. So, so. let me go backwards a little bit. <laughs> Mark and I are, have a very good friendship. We've been around a long time. Do you remember when I bought this building? Oh, my God. It was, was it 12? 2013. 13, yeah. Remember who I said should be my neighbor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we've, we've, we've actually looked at a lot of deals together and stuff like that. You... You are also aren't just a CPA. You own a lot of real estate. I do. I do. Nothing compared to what you own, but I do own a considerable <laughs> amount of real estate. <laughs> you own a lot of real estate, and you've invested in some of the markets that we're in together. Right. And that's exciting that you're in some other markets that I'm not in. Um, first of all, how important are taxes for people who invest in real estate? Huge. Huge, because I mean, obviously, if you have a way of avoiding taxes um, to reduce your taxes, you can take that extra funds and you can put it towards real estate investment. Without that, then you know you're going to be spending money that other people who are in your same industry aren't spending. Right. So it's just a it matter, and it's information. More competitive. Yes, it's information. The more information that you have about how you can make decisions, the better that you are in in avoiding that. One of the things I want to get to right away, because I know people who are listening to this show want to know, like, hey. Cut to the chase. How do I save money if I'm a real estate investor? One of the first things that you had me do was was set up an LLC. Right. Why does a real estate investor need – why does a business owner need to set up an LLC? If you have business, why should you do that? Well, for legal protection, just to start. Because, you know, when you're in real estate, <clears throat> it's considered a dangerous asset. Right. And, uh, and so you want to protect, you know, whatever is in there – you know, can have the exposure, but in anything you own outside of that is not going to be exposed to that problem. Uh, if you just own exposed. it personally, exposed, yes, like as in, <laughs> as in having a problem. If you have a lawsuit, you're going to have a problem. Like somebody can uh, go after it. Can go after all of your assets. Right. If you have something, if you have those assets in an LLC, there's protection and also protection for the assets that are outside of it. And not so, only that, but you save money with taxes. Excellent I, thing to do. Yes, you do save money with taxes. <laughs> How much money do you save in taxes for having an LLC? Well, it, it depends on the structure that you set up because. Um, um, it's not just this, the LLC is the legal structure, but there's different formats. You've got partnerships, you've got S corporations. Um, and when you're looking at doing those structures, everything depends on whether you're an operating business or strictly real estate investment. If you're a real estate investment, then um, sometimes partnerships work better. And it also depends on how flexible things are. You want to be able to um, to uh, give distributions different than than you know just straight based on your ownership percentage, you can do that. You can take certain losses in partnerships where you can't take losses in S corps on certain things. So it just depends on the circumstances that you have that will will give you you know the best uh, situation possible for you to be able to save money. So you're saying that accounting is full of a bunch of rules, and if you understand the rules. You could play the game better, which is real estate. Yes. Or did I just make that up? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's totally true. It's I, I, I noticed so many times when, you know, we were looking at different scenarios and all we had to do was really follow the funny part was follow the regs. You know, you follow the IRS code and you find out Oh my God! They're actually recommending you do this, and <laughs> and and when you do that, you're able to save tons of money. You know, there's ways to accelerate depreciation, which oh is a paper God. entry. Oh, <laughs> listen. So this is so funny. So Mark <laughs> is like, is polite as they come, and he's not the guy who's gonna jump up on the table and <laughs> tell you, "Hey, you're stupid." I mean, he might say it like about me behind. That. <laughs> nice. That's good. No, I'm saying because we're friends and yeah. he could joke about that sort of thing. But literally the building that we're sitting in here right now, he was with me when I bought it and you know, another client of his owns a property uh, <laughs> across the way. We'll go there later. <laughs> <laughs> so, we ended up uh, looking at this property and he was talking about this cost segregation. And this is and and he all I heard was 
six thousand dollars. The which, cost of the study. The cost of the study, <laughs> and and I didn't hear anything else. And and then I start going to all these seminars. And I keep hearing these guys having these magic tricks about how to save money through ex- depreciation. And I didn't understand it. It just didn't make sense to me. Like everything that I had been taught my whole life, that doesn't make sense. So can you talk to me about what we eventually did do on this building, sure. which was cost segregation and how that works in real estate? So what happens with cost segregation study is you, you normally when you have a commercial building – you're able to depreciate it over a 39-year period. However, under the cost segregation rules, you're allowed to take components of the building and separate them out from the structure. For example, land improvements and uh, HVAC, plumbing, things that can be removed from the structure without damage to the structure, and then depreciate those over shorter lives, which means more depreciation earlier. And because you do that, you can take, uh, let's say, enough depreciation possibly in the first year to even give you enough money if you're in a high tax bracket to be able to uh, get the down payment for your building. So it, it, it really is a huge saver. I have a client that we did, um, I think it was about 10 properties in a year, and he was making about three, four million dollars in um, advertising industry and was heavy in real estate. He said, Mark, this was the first time in 25 years that I didn't have to pay any tax because of what you did. And I was like, that's terrific. I can (laughs) second that notion. And it took me a long time to hear you because you're not the type of guy that's like, (laughs) hey, um, what you're doing right now is not a good use. And I'm going to lead you over here, but I can't force you to drink the water. But what and, and let's talk about one more thing. You also this is the type of accountant that you want. Mark calls me. Okay, and he says, hey, this is right when COVID happened. And he says, the CARES Act just happened. And I said, it's a big deal. And he (laughs) goes, well, I go, how does that affect me? And he says, well, it affects you because why? Because you they put in a provision because of everything that was happening at the time where people were, you know, losing their businesses, um, drastic drops in, in income. And the IRS basically handed out a parachute. They basically said, hey, we're going to allow you where the tax law had changed, where you couldn't carry losses backwards uh, in 2017. We're going to allow you to carry these losses from 2018, 19, and 20 back five years to tax years that you may have had significant income. And I've had clients, I have uh, a couple clients that have had um, several million dollars in loss carrybacks that they're getting money for. So... Uh, it's been a huge help, and I know we did that for Troy, and it was really good. Yeah, so for layman's terms, because it sounds complicated, depreciation is basically a loss for you know for argument's sake. They call these things fancy words that when you don't understand them, they're, they don't make sense to you. So when people say depreciation, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. But essentially, that means you're putting a negative in front of that number on, on, the, on the paperwork that Mark's submitting to the IRS, okay, against the income that you produce. And if that outweighs the income, then you have a loss, even though you didn't lose money, really. You yeah. lo- lost money in the future that the IRS is letting you take today. Okay? Right. And then what happens is if you have that loss and then you paid income because of that CARES Act, you've paid income taxes, then you can go carry that loss backwards and then reclaim that income. And that's what we were able to do for myself personally. We were able to regain some of the taxes that I had paid in because of the losses I was able to carry backwards. Correct. And can people still do that? Uh, for 18, 19, and 20, 18 is going to run out of statute and at some point this year, depending on when you filed your taxes. But if, yeah. if somebody wanted to hire Mark Sherman at Sherman CPAs, how would they get a hold of your team? They could call our office, and we have a great admin staff. We've got four people that, that literally can answer phones, take um, you know appointments, set things up so we can meet and go over things. I could do conference calls, Zooms. I can meet in person. Do you have a telephone number that you want to give out? 702-645-6318. And a website in case they're checking? Yeah, shermancpas.com. How do we get your newsletter so that we can uh, – you, are you still doing the thing where you got to guess the uh, – Oh, the, the no, we have, different, we have different games what, that the, we play. What's the newsletter now? What's the game we're playing now? Well, they do it on, online. I think we do it for um, referrals and stuff. We do, uh, we do awards um, for that. Um, you know, one who gets the most referrals gets gift cards that we send out to them. Just right then and there, we've just – condensed how a real estate investor can 
basically go like well let's talk about the property that i bought in uh in mississippi because this is important you're in part of every like mark is important important part of everything that i do in my life he is one of the masters in my mastermind and he knows that and you know <laughs> what i mean and we, and we and if anybody ever asked me for an account i say call this guy if you're not an idiot just like uh, there's I lead, and I haven't sent one person to you that hasn't called me back and thanked me profusely. And that's, that's, that's and, and he acted like a gosh dang celebrity to try to get here. <laughs> How long have we been trying to plan this? <laughs> it's been a few months. <laughs> okay. Because this guy does not stop working. And Mark's, you could set a clock to Mark. When we used to, we used to work out at the gym back when we uh, <laughs> lived up in um, LVAC. And he, like, he's like, uh, how's five o'clock? And I'm like, early. <laughs> uh, PM? AM? He's like, I guess I could do 545. <laughs> and then, so we ended up getting to 545, and then I ended up pushing it he to 630. To 630. <laughs> <laughs> and we worked out, but my whole point is like, he, in, in terms of, if you want to take the word accountability in a, of accountant, he represents that fact. And you could consider yourself lucky to be able to have an account like him because he's looking out after all of his clients' best interest when you call. And I, and I always tell people like, they're like, I got the best account. And I'm like, have they told you about any of this? And they're like, no. And I'm like, <laughs> that's well, a problem. They're not that good because my guy's <laughs> physically picking up the phone and calling me and sharing information that is helping my business grow. And yours isn't. So why don't you use mine? Who does? <laughs> And um, that's why you're on here because of how intelligent you are and how much I respect the hell out of you. Thanks. Yeah, that happened just recently, like with uh, that lady from uh, Nashville, you know. Which one? No, Nashville from Kansas City. Oh yes. yes. So I just referred <laughs> you, my realtor friend Andrea. Yeah. And, yeah, nice uh, lady. And she's doing a cost segregation right now because of that. Yeah. And looking forward to seeing what happens there. Yeah. She's actually <laughs> just been on our podcast as well. Oh, that's great. Mark, one thing you know, that is people don't know about you. We're going to talk about this a little bit before we get back on accounting. Um, you love Halloween. Yes, it is my uh, favorite holiday. <laughs> That's why I wore the wig in the beginning. <laughs> just because I just, I got them for something we were going to do here. And I just ran in there. I was like, oh, I'm going to wear this for the first part. Just because it's you. <laughs> because you're always like, you're always dressing up. And the other thing you love doing is moving. Yes, I do like, I know I am, um, how do I put it? I don't have an affinity for personal residences. How right. about that? <laughs> how many houses have we, uh, me and my wife, oh my God. sold you? Probably six or more or something like that. This I mean, year? Yeah. This year. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you know, my wife, she's always saying, oh, I love this. And I said, look, honey, it's a sinkhole. Okay. You put money in, the money goes in and everything goes, goes into the house. You go out, out, out. All money goes out. No money comes in. Right. I said, that's not an investment, right, right? Okay, it's a pretty place, but it's not an investment. But this, this, so. the, the less you find that with the <laughs> wife, and you just start buying other investment properties. Yes, the, the, exactly. The better your life is. I did the trade off. <laughs> I said, "You want this? I get this." Right? That's it. Yeah, that's. that's it. <laughs> Let's talk about. So, where are you currently invested right now? Um, I've got properties in Michigan, in Mississippi, in Ohio, um, and then in Vegas. Okay, and. You, you've you sold a lot of stuff in Vegas, though. Yes, I did sell a lot of this last year because the prices were ridiculous. Ridiculous. It was like you could get more than 20, 25 years of rent in one sale. So so you ended up selling them. Did you put that money into more real estate? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I bought How, I Which bought vehicle did you use to, to do that? Or 1031. Which vi- and, and what's a 1031 exchange? So a 1031 is, is uh, a code section in the IRS law that basically says, look, you're allowed to do what I'm about to tell you, which is – you can take property that you acquired and you can take the gain that you got from the sale of that property when you're going to sell it and you can roll it into the next property that you're going to buy and not pay any tax currently. In other words, you're basically essentially kicking the can down the road where you can continue to make investments and earn more money, earn a return on your investment while all the while not being taxed on that money. And then you could continue to do it. And, and with the existing tax law, what's exciting, you could you could literally keep rolling this into larger and larger investments. And then even, uh, you know, based on the existing uh, state law, you could literally <laughs> – 
leave the money, leave the property for your heirs, and then they get what's called a step up in basis, which I know that sounds complicated, but it's basically helping you uh, to help your children to not pay any taxes if they sell it after you die and they leave it to you inheritance. That's a mouthful. <laughs> yes, it is a lot. <laughs> so, but let me ask you this. So if I 1031 my property, let's say it's like me, I bought these cheap houses, as you know, in Vegas that went Scott, so did you. We both did. Fourplexes? <laughs> yes. Buttes. Buttes. We both were. The funny thing is we were having a conversation at the gym one time. I know you were going to remember this. Yes. So Mark and I are talking about our – and I had had seven fourplexes at that time. <laughs> I had loaded up – I had bought a bunch of houses in not desirable areas, so I would moved up to more desirable areas with less desirable properties, which were fourplexes on – in some bad areas of town. And, you know, Mark is one of those guys, like sometimes when you talk to him, you feel like just nothing touches him. Just like, it it just kind (laughs) of skips over him. Like, you know, like he got called on first, you know what I mean? That type of thing. And so we're talking and I'm like, man, I'm having all these problems with my fourplex. He's like, mine are all rented and everything's great. I'm like, I go, Mark, you know, you know, and then the conversation went <laughs> That's on. That's not real. The, uh, the not conversation real. went on for several months because we worked out for several years. And eventually I said, you know, Mark, I think I'm going to sell my properties. And I would strongly suggest that you don't load up. <laughs> He's like, you know, we're not happy. We have great the returns are out of this world. And then. Yeah. And then. <laughs> oh, yeah. Then there was that. Oh, my God. Two, two girls moved into the upstairs of a downstairs upstairs uh, uh, fourplex, one of the units. And. They decided to flush the toilet with a tampon and put it in there and then um, go to sleep. (laughs) And so then the entire thing got flooded like within like two or three inches of water all over the place and had to re just totally tear out the insides of the place for three weeks. And then I told you about it and it. You said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's... You it's know, not the usual. That's not but the there's usual. also <laughs> things that, like, you know, we learn as investors, like, what our flavor is. We learn right. as business people. Like, you've started other businesses, too. Yes. Let's. Can we talk about that one? <laughs> sure, we can talk about that. All right, so <laughs> this was a, another gym conversation that we had lots yes. of. Yes, yes. And, and that's what friends do is we talk about, yeah. like, oh, okay, can we nudge each other a little bit here about, like, these are things. So Mark had been... I guess is a lifetime garage sailor is the best way to say that. <laughs> My wife was. Your, your yeah. wife was. Yeah, she was. She, she really loved. loved. She loved doing that, and it was it was hilarious because I mean we could afford to buy more expensive clothes for our kids as they were growing up, but she she just loved going to garage sales and she'd find these name brands and she'd take you know and clothe our kids because two months later they'd grow out of it. Right. Uh-huh. So she thought that's a great concept. So then she bumps into this franchise um, called Plato's Closet, and it was great. You know, I thought the concept was great. The training, everything was really good, and we liked it for a while until we realized we were dealing with 20 teenagers that worked for us at any one time, and that was um, a nightmare. <laughs> right. <laughs> because – Well, you became yeah. – you became like – you bought yourself a job. Right. I mean, for her, she would never could never really take time off because it was always between some you know guy that – uh, didn't come in because he was drunk, hungover, or he smoked something, or you know his Oops. parents said that they, yeah, his parents said they were uh, were um, you know leaving, um, and he had to go with them. And by the way, I can't give you any notice, yeah, so, you know stuff like that. So, and then one time I just had it, you know, I, I was after tax season, I was ready to go, and Margie said, "Sorry, we can't go because I got I, I got my manager just quit on me, and I just I have to cover the ships." And I said, "Oh." So I said, nothing's worth that. I, I really like real estate a lot. Yeah. So <laughs> at the end of the day, it was just like your yeah. time and your money and yeah. where are you spending it? And you've gotten back into realizing that the two best and most important parts of your time are building your CPA business right. and continuing to invest in real estate. Because when you decide to do whatever, sell your business, right? do whatever you want to do with your business, you know that that real estate is it's still, still work, there. Is still, <laughs> and would you say that, your business, um, in, in as an investor, do you make a lot of money from real estate? A little money from real estate? Could it uh, could it potentially replace your income? Here's what I'll tell you. In you know, we met in two thousand and ten. Nine. Are you sure? I thought it was ten, but I'm okay. <laughs> so yeah, nine. Nine. Okay. Nine, so years. don't forget again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so in. Nine, you know, you got me, you got the bug in my ear. And literally from that point, I started to build real estate. And, um, you know, as of right now, I, yeah, I don't have to work. If I want to, I could literally just mailbox money it. And, you know, 
And, and how does that feel? It's fantastic. It makes – well, you know, I always love my work. I don't right. really look at the clock. A lot of people, you know, they look at their job like it's a prison sentence and, right. you know, when am I getting out? And well, you're, it's not your job. It's your business. Right. And I look at it like how can I help more people? I enjoy doing that. So it's a lot different. But um, but nonetheless, you know, yeah, there, there are times where, like anybody with a business, you know, you've had, you know, experience like with the tow business. <laughs> oh, my you know? God. It's, it's, I'm going to hold you, know. you partially responsible for that <laughs> so it's it's exciting um it, you know when you know that something like real estate that you've built um is there for you in other words it doesn't it's so funny i thought about it even with the downturn right with real estate it's like the quality of tenant improves <laughs> when you when you actually go through a downturn i never thought that could happen but it's, <laughs> yeah. it actually it just keeps getting better folks <laughs> yeah and and then you know you had looked at some of the stuff that I was doing, and then you're like, "I'm gonna invest in Mississippi." Right? Can we let's can we have a fun conversation about <laughs> like? So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, poke fun of somebody. We're not gonna say that person's name, but we have a uh, you have a friend, or maybe we don't both have a friend. I don't know who that person <laughs> is. Anyways, anyways, we know a person, <laughs> and you know it's interesting how some people can just have all the money all the tools, all the skill set, but be so pig-headed thinking when it comes to it. And if you're just open-minded to thinking a different way with real estate, like the sky's the limit. Like the fact that you're willing to, like once you went to Mississippi, you felt comfortable because you knew I was comfortable there. We went yeah. there together. The system was there. That was the big thing. You know, the right. property management and the real estate agent and the whole system was there, even the rehab, everything. So well, you had looked at the, my taxes for the last yeah. year or so, and you're like, this guy's... Right, you have a winning formula. So I said, I, you know, why would I want to reinvent the wheel when I could just look at what you've done? Yeah, and you take that and ran with it, and then there's, and then your whole family bought up the rest of Mississippi. <laughs> and... <laughs> I know, you said to me at one point, Mark, I didn't want you to tell everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could tell them about Kansas City because there's plenty of inventory. Funny. That was funny. But yeah... <laughs> The thing is, so you've invested there. You went over to Ohio. Are you? Are you? What is? What's going on with your real estate career? You. I know you sold a bunch of stuff this year because my wife. I was involved in every deal. In fact, <laughs> I actually was. This is the funniest crap ever. I have represented one buyer, it or maybe two. It like the first deal I did. I remember it was a, it was an Indian family. They were great. I drove their daughter around. They were. They, they're amazing people and they were super great with me. And the other buyer deal I did was 15 years later, which is <laughs> representing the buyer of one of the houses that you bought and are now <laughs> sold, which was the uh, tower at Allure. Oh yeah. And you know, I haven't represented a buyer. The only reason That's we hilarious. did that was because that was your deal. Like, I mean, commission aside, I mean, I'm not, yeah, that, that helped, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't you because I just, don't like to do that stuff and i feel like when you surround yourself with people who can help you and inspire you and make you better including your accountant then you should want to like this mark sends my kids like he's like literally what the uncle that they never had like they get christmas gifts hanukkah gifts from <laughs> you and everything like that and He's been a big part of my success, like as an investor. And um, I think that's really important to note is because you grow with who you surround yourself around. And if you're, I know for, for instance, like how many times I've been on the phone with you where you're at a training in California? Yeah. Yeah, we, we spend a lot of time in practice management, and I spend a lot of time annually just doing continuing education and keeping up on what's going on. You know, it's like a ever-changing world. <laughs> right. Now, do you think that accounting is important for business? Oh, my God. <laughs> You know, it's funny. I tell some people who've been who go into business, like they're in in college and they're taking classes, and I'll say, "Well, you might want to take at least a couple accounting classes because if you do, no matter what you do later, you're going to need it in some capacity." So, I wanted to ask a few questions um, r with regards to um, you know a lot of people have been having questions about the IRS rules for depreciation of cars, or we'll call it <coughs> loss for cars, mm -hmm. and you know, learning the toe game, one of the things I learned in the toe game 
is that, wow, it's a great business for depreciation loss. And now you can see why all the rental car yeah. companies make money. All the uh, Ahern places who are able to depreciate all of their equipment make money yeah. because they're going in with a loss in the beginning end that they're able to finance. And if they, as long as they can control their receivables and everything like that, they're going to be okay. So with that being said, how, what are the rules that allow you to depreciate your car your vehicle, semi truck, whatever they mm -hmm. are, and how can you apply it for them? So, what happens is you first have to establish whether there's business purpose to the vehicle you're going to use. So, let's assume that so you've got someone who has a, a business vehicle. They have two, they have one that's a personal vehicle. Can I give you an example? Yeah, sure. So, I bought a Porsche just right now, and I'm going to rent it out on Turo when I'm not here. So, it's going to be a business, and then I'll right. rent it out for myself when I'm not when I'm not, when I'm here, right? Yeah. And so the money's essentially going in my pocket. There's the tax man's getting a little piece of it. And right. then as you know, it's just accounting. So how would that work? So with those, those are luxury vehicles. You're going to have certain limitations as to how much depreciation um, in the first year that you can take. Usually it's about 18,000 if it's hundred percent business use. And then after that, you've got more each year that you can take, but it's not um, because it's not a vehicle that's over a certain weight. Um, if you have a vehicle that's over 6,000 pounds, um, like let's say a pickup truck or a van, um, or even a semi heavy SUV. Yeah. Semi. <laughs> so a semi porch, um, a, se a semi truck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, a, a so basically so, yeah. it's 6,000 pounds yeah. and there's nothing else after that. Well, in other words, you, if you have a heavy vehicle, like I said, a van or a truck that's that weight, then you can take 100% business use, take a, a whole ride off of the vehicle in the first year. So the Mercedes Sprinter van. That's an excellent one. I have a, a few clients that are in the um, in the travel business or they do tours. Yeah, you're able to, to take those and they've saved a lot of money. I told them as a recommendation though, because they bought it financed, I said, make sure you advance pay down the debt because if you ever run into a problem and sure enough, when this whole pandemic hit, they had paid down all of their debt and it was great because they were able to get the vehicle sold, make some money, and and buy back when they, you know, the business came back. It's exactly what we did with the vehicles at the tow game. I, I'm selling the business right now. There's no debt on the company. We took the loss early on uh, when we needed it because yeah. the business hasn't made money for years. Um, so w when we talk about you know Plato's closet and we talk about quick tow, we talk about not necessarily failures because we both didn't fail at them. You learn from those experiences. Just like yeah. a waste of your time in terms of like, wow, I'm going to go and start a business that I know nothing about <laughs> and learn everything about it. Right. And then, ex and then expect to be better. at It's like, I'm going to just grow my accounting business. I'm going to grow my yeah. real estate portfolio. And when you talk in business is super hard. It's, would you argue it's harder than real estate? Well, yeah, because you may have more moving parts. And, you know, you're dealing with people in real estate, but you're dealing with a lot more people in an operating business usually. So some of the let's talk about some of the deals that you bought this that you just recently sold and what those look like, just so somebody can say, like, what the ups. I know we don't talk about upside a lot as investors because mm -hmm. we don't really count on it. Like, I think you you and I are cash flow guys. Yes. When we first <laughs> met, you had the little... Uh, on, thing on your car, which you were driving a Porsche, I think at the time, <laughs> it was like knickknack or it was called the Kiyosaki thing. What was it? Doodad. Doodad, yeah. Yeah, you had your call <laughs> called a doodad because you're like, you know, listen, I don't really care about anything other than cash flow until I go to sell something. But you recently just realized that, wow, my appreciation is outpacing my cash flow by 25 <laughs> years. Yeah. So it's time to go and put that cash in a better right. place where I can get more cash flow. And who cares if the asset's not appreciating at the same pace? I'm getting more cash flow, which allows me to retire earlier. Right. And people always mistake and say, well, what's your net worth? And I'm like, it don't matter. What's your net cash flow? Because that's what matters. That is what matters. Like if you have a, a $100 million house, and that's and you have it paid off free and clear, <laughs> but you have taxes that are due, and that you have sewer bills that are due, and you got to have people to come and clean it. Who cares about your hundred million dollar net worth? It doesn't if mean if I've anything. got ten million dollars <laughs> in cash flow. Yeah. Who cares? Right. And that's the bottom line. A lot of people focus on, hey, I've got to, I've got to build my my 
you know, war chest of cash so that I can get a 5% return and make this kind of money. And I said, no, you don't want to look at it like that way. You want to look at it. How much money do you need to live the way you want to live every month? And the only way you're going to know that is that's mailbox money. In other words, real estate produces that. You're dating yourself. We call it ACH these days. ACH. <laughs> yes. Do you check your mail for your mailbox money anymore? <laughs> or you just hit refresh on Appfolio? Yes. <laughs> so these days, it's actually easier than that. You don't have to go to the bank and cash the check. Right. You you have a great property manager, and really what you do is you work on your skill set, which is refining, trying to take the biggest losses that you can, grow your real estate portfolio, and have excellent management. And hopefully over time, you can... Oh, one more thing I meant to an- uh, ask you about the 1031 exchanges. And I may- Maybe I did ask you, but did you can refinance that money, right? Well, here's... What, okay, so here's what happens when you buy a property um, or, or you're about to sell the existing property... Uh, the way the formula works is you got to have equal or greater sales price, equal or greater debt, and equal or greater equity. So then that means when you're when you've got the property, let's say you got a million dollar property and it's got two hundred thousand debt on it. Okay. Okay. Then so eight hundred thousand. You got to find a property that right. You got to find a property that is a sales price of at least a million dollars, and you could buy it free and clear by adding more cash, or you can just get more debt on that same property, that replacement property equal to the debt you had on this old property. Okay. But let's say I did this. Let's say I bought a property, same property. Mm-hmm. Let's say the property that you I was gonna sell I actually bought I actually owned it was yeah it was worth I paid two hundred it's worth a million mm-hmm. I refinance it take it to seventy five percent pull all my cash out oh prior to the exchange prior to the exchange okay got it a year before the exchange okay prior to the exchange and then I say you know what I'm gonna sell it I'm gonna take the twenty five percent I have left in the property mm-hmm. use that as my down payment. Mm-hmm. Could I do that? Yeah. Because do I, do I gotta pay taxes on that money? No. What? Because, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's great about that is you you literally when people they see the appreciation on their property, they're able to do a cash out refinance and the debt that's still on that property um, with with the existing rental income, they're still making money. And so they've gotten this cash out of the property that where most people, they would just sit idle and not have, have anything going on other than the rental income. Now you've got additional cash that you can use to invest in further properties. Right. So you're saying you could buy more cash flow with more cash? Yes. <laughs> right. Interesting. ACH. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say crypto. <laughs> Are you are you into the NFTs or the uh, crypto or anything? Like I, that? I'm not, but I'm not saying it's not a, a, a f- the future or an interesting way to go because I do have a number of clients that are getting into that. The biggest question of the day is the intrinsic value and what's going to happen with, you know, how many goods or services can we trade for that? Is there going to be such a, a general, you know, uh, consensus that we can buy anything with it? Then it's going to have just as much confidence as the U.S. dollar. So Right. So – Big question: If you if you were to go back um, as a young child, or not a young child, but like Mark, early on in life, looking back at where you're at today, what advice would you give to your young Mark or the young person on the other end of the line, or your children that you probably have given their advice, and even though they're not going to listen to you because that's how children <laughs> they have to don't. burn their hands on the stove. Yeah, by themselves. exactly. <laughs> if you're not interested in burning your hand on the stove, what advice would you give? to people who are listening or the younger Mark to do that would accelerate your uh, ability to retire at an earlier stage? The biggest thing that I see with most people, and, you know, it's uh, it's something that um, uh, Robert Kiyosaki mentions quite a bit, is, um, is they buy liabilities. They don't buy assets. So they buy things that don't produce cash flow and it doesn't put money in their pocket. And not only that, but it causes them to pay more out, which means there's this vicious cycle of them working harder and harder to try to pay off their obligations. And all the while they're getting kind of burned out on <laughs> on the asset, the thing that they, they bought, not the asset. And so I would say the first thing is to train people. And I do this quite a bit because I, I actually um, – meet with kids and I teach them about finance for free. And I I say to them, look, um, this is what you want to do. I said, if you do this, you invest in assets first before you even pay your own bills, you do that. Then you're going to be far 
further along than many people are. So do you, for those people who say, well, that's easy to say, you know, you make a lot of money, you got a bunch of real estate investing. I, I want to tell you, do you have any clients of yours who make millions of dollars? Yes. Do, do you have those clients who make millions of dollars but spend more than they make? Many. Many. Would you say that's the majority of people in general? Yeah, because they just don't get the con – they figure they're never going to die, I guess. I, I don't know what the deal is, but they just – you know, they make tons of money, and uh, they pay the taxes and on all the realizable income, and then uh, they, don't, they don't save. It's a crazy thing. Do you think that someone, if they got serious investing in real estate, like flipping houses, buying cheap houses for cash, could retire in five years? Yeah, I do. If their end game, it's what their end game is. If their end game is, is uh, you know, the holding of rentals afterwards. In other words, the flip is great. It creates velocity of money. It creates all the cash necessary to be able to reinvest and do something. But if but that creates taxes. Yeah, That's active does. income. How do I get rid of active income if, right. I, if I'm flipping? Right. That's where you invest in rental properties. So you're saying I can generate income from flipping properties. Right. And then I can offset the taxes I make from flipping those properties by investing in cash flowing properties? Right. We just did that, in fact, for a couple of different clients. That's kind of interesting. Probably some you may have interviewed. Um, <laughs> Wait, who, who's that? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyways, Confidential. Um, anyway, so, um, but no, it was great. We took um, a situation where they had um, uh, flipped money and then they invested in rental properties. Then we did cost segregation studies on the rental properties. They got, um, they got their money and then they actually decided to flip those properties the following year and because they're in the highest tax bracket on one side, they're paying 37, they're getting a deduction at 37%. But then on the other side, when they have to recapture the depreciation the year later because they sold the property, they pay a 25 <laughs> because right. the tax law, it's like, hey, wonderful. Yeah, it's just understanding the laws. And, and you, what you're saying basically is that you can make a lot of money. You don't have to have a lot of money to make a lot of money in real estate. You can do it in pretty much any market. You're investing. Do you go to Michigan a lot? No. Have you, when's, have you, I don't think I've ever been there, actually. Really? Yeah, it's funny because my father was born there, and my mother said, "Oh, don't, don't go there." <laughs> you know, and um, there's, there's our opportunities. There's, uh, you know, for buying and everything, but uh, I don't really need to go there to do that. That's what's great about the technology we have with cell phones, with you know, being able to get virtual tours on a phone and be able to do inspections by video and everything. Would you say you're a control freak? Well, I would say that, you know, I'd like to know what's going on. Right. But yeah. not, okay, sorry, the bad word. Would you say that you like to be in control of things? Right. Yes, because I feel like control equals income. The more you can control the outcome of something, the more you can make it. Does being there equal control? Being there? No, not necessarily. Right. So for those of you guys who are like stuck in the thing that I got to be there, Understand that. Get out of that mindset. You might have to go there once. Yeah, to, that would be, you know, <laughs> yes. so tax deductible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's talk about that. So is travel. What what deduction is travel? It's 100 percent. So if I go to Mexico, I just went to Cabo San Lucas and I looked at a bunch of real estate there I actually filmed a bunch of TikToks for my social media business doing that. Is that 100 percent tax deductible? Yeah, because you have a business purpose and it's, you know, reasonable and ordinary in the course of what you're doing. OK, great. And so if we got it all on film, that's obviously perfect proof, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's helpful. It is. I have a number of people in social media businesses and literally they have a way of you know because of what they're doing they can they can deduct many things you know they always say one of the things that used to confuse the crap out of me is if you want to save money this is before i really started getting heavy into real estate investing this is just as me as like a a 1099 or a w2 employee people would say well if you want to save money start a business and i didn't understand it but now meaning that like your business doesn't have to be successful but the irs because let's say you're a fisherman and it's a hobby, but and you make fish and you make uh, flies for guys and you sell them to your buddies for ten bucks or whatever. You don't do too many, but you decide to start a small business that you're going to sell ten flies a year and they're going to sell them for ten bucks a year and the paperwork and everything like that. You know, whatever you're doing, teaching, cra training, it's just whatever. It's not that great of a business, but everything that you do involved around that business becomes what deductible. In other words, the whole thing, what I mentioned earlier was 
the definition of a deductible expense is what is ordinary and necessary in the course of that business. So if, you know, making the flies, if you have to travel a certain place to do this, everything that you can document associated with your deduction is going to make that deduction deductible. I want to end on like a couple questions. One specifically that I don't want to forget to a ask you is when do you get, there's a certain category that the IRS, once you're a real estate professional, right? Okay. So when you're just investing and you have a, a, a job that you get most of your income, you're not a real estate professional. Correct. But if you sell real estate, you're a real estate professional. Mm, yes. And no. Can you explain? You know where I'm going yeah. with it. Explain because I'm not getting there very fast. So no, help no, me no out. Problem. So the IRS has certain rules about um, being a real estate professional. You have to meet a certain number of hours of um, material trades and activities associated with real estate. So uh, And also – um, how you deal with individual properties. They look at each property as an activity. So there's there's a number of those kind of rules. I find that sometimes people will do that. They'll go into the idea thinking that, well, I don't do anything and I'm just kind of managing a few properties, you know, for my husband or wife or something. And they're not really, ta they're not taking it seriously. They have to be able to log their time that they did this. They have to be able to show the activities. They can't use their, you know, certain things um, as, uh, as hours. In other words, they have to have certain activities that qualify for the hours. So there's a number of things that are involved in, in becoming a real estate professional on paper um, with this. And, but what's nice about it is that should you have losses from your real estate properties and you are a real estate professional, <clears throat> you can take the full extent of the losses against any other active income which is really beneficial. Can you break that down? So let's say hypothetically that... Um, Do you use me as an example? Okay, so let's say you have, you have uh, you know, rental income from other properties, and let's say that you had some properties that just, you know, you did a, a lot of rehab, you had a tough time with some tenants or whatever, and there were losses generated from it. You can take the full extent of those losses from that property and allocate it here because, you know, if we use a what's called a grouping, you have ability to group all your properties as a single activity. Then the IRS looks at that activity and says that's one activity, even though there's a number of properties in there. Because they, one of the rules is they say, look, you gotta, you gotta be able to um, show that you spend 100 hours a year on each rental activity or each activity. So if all the activities are grouped, it's pretty easy to spend eight hours, you know, a month on a bunch of real estate versus what's the rule you have to spend how many hours eight hours a month or 100 hours a year basically is what it as is. a real estate professional that's just one of the rules but yeah and then you're qualified to take is it like 65 percent or what is the total like are you no you can take in other words if the loss is from a real estate property is there you can take the full extent of that loss against your active even if it's depreciation income. yeah Okay, so you don't actually have to lose the money to take the loss. Right, it's a paper loss, right? That's Yes, it's huge. I mean, So the, the, here's what I figured out this far in my life, and it's taken me a long time to figure out, but it's because of Mark, is that accounting is just how, where you put things on the piece of paper that you hand to the IRS. And the guy that you hire to put him there and what he understands and knows and the knowledge base that he brings to it is going to determine two things. One, how much money you save, and two, how much trouble you get in. And... You've already proved how much money that you can save people by this amazing interview. I can't thank you enough. I mean, you're dropping bombs left and right. Oh, thanks. <laughs> One uh, question that I'd have is, what happens if I get audited? You, we've just spilled the beans on sure, all sure. this stuff out here right now. Um, you always leave me with a question, like kind of like with a sarcastic thing, is like you're only as good as your last audit. Right. You're a, well, I always say you're a hero. <laughs> <laughs> until you get audited. Right. And so many times I get people who come to me who say, well, this guy did this and that guy did this. My friend did this. My friend did that. And I said, yeah, everybody's a hero until they get audited because <laughs> because then they find out what is really OK to do or not do. Right. And so with an audit, um, it's just a procedure. There's three kinds. There's a correspondence audit. Then there's a, um, you know, a um, compliance audit. And then there's a field audit. The the correspondence audit is simply a letter that you might get that says, hey, we think, you know, uh, you didn't report this income or, you know, you didn't have this on your return. So uh, we're calculating what it think it should be, uh, you know, plus some interest. Please take care of it or let us know if it's different. 
Right. And then there's the second one, which is a compliance audit, and that's a they send you a letter saying, "Hey, we got a couple items we want to look at, but we'd like to see you in person." Right. <laughs> and so then they, they what's kinda, that one called? Yeah, compliance audit. Oh yeah, I had that. That's one. That's where they look at, out of a couple key items. They want to have you come to the office right now with COVID. It's really been on you know phone interviews, but nice. Of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then there's they're overstaffed right now too, aren't they? Overstaffed. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw something in the news like they are. They yeah, are. that's a whole nother conversation. Right. Um, and then there's the field audit, which is normally uh, outside of COVID. They would actually want to come to your business operations, and they would want to possibly interview employees and look at other things. That's where we come in, and we're able to kind of uh, control that narrative a little bit, get kind of in front of what that looks like, and be able to um, satisfy what the auditor is looking for, and at the same time, um, you know, protect you as a client. So that uh, because many times I get clients that want to meet with the auditor. And the problem with that is that they're not just sitting there answering the questions that the auditor is asking. They're forwarding much more information <laughs> that has nothing to do with the audit and can cause other issues. Right. So that's important to note. One other thing, you know, in 2009 was I know what was 2009 because I always talk about the lessons I learned. And, uh, you know, that was one of the key lessons I learned in 2009 was it's not about accounting it's about your accountant the other lesson i learned uh prior to that was bookkeeping and you know accounting is great and people always brag about but literally if you're a good accountant you're just moving numbers around and you and and if that bookkeeping doesn't match that how good is that audit yeah it's a problem it's a problem because you know you're going to bring to light hey you know get your books and records are supposed to be accurate and you're supposed to be able to show them if they want to see a detail of or breakdown of a number, then you should be able to pull that and show them. What happens many times is they're going to see, you know, let's say they select, um, you know, hey, I want to look at this item, and then you drill down and you can provide them with a list of those items, and they can select from those lists what they want to pull for actual receipts. It's not like they're saying, please provide 100% of every single item, because that would be time-consuming and probably not cost-effective. Do I still got to keep copies of all my receipts? It's a good idea to keep your receipts scanned is the easiest, because you know that way you don't have to worry about them fading later. But usually, uh, seven years from data filing is what you want to keep your records for. So Unless you... I heard something, unless you... Uh, made some sort of a cheat or something, right? They can go back. Well, if you're, yeah. If I've actually heard this on they TikTok can, the yes, other day. They can, if you, you, you mean if you commit fraud? Correct. Yeah, then they can go back seven years from the data file. And normal audits are within usually three years. Uh, in other words, if you've gone three years past, um, you know, the tax filing for that year, high probability you're not going to be selected for audit for that year. Why Why would someone be selected for audit? I mean, it sounds like a pretty noble. I, I was obviously selected for audit, so <laughs> I've had the Congratulations, dubious, right? dubious honor. How, how does somebody not get selected for audit? Well, uh, you know, the thing is that the percentages are pretty low right now, um, but what I will tell you is that um, the people that typically, what they look at more than anything um, are uh, Schedule C taxpayers, people on individual uh, sole proprietor form on their personal return. And uh, the reason is because most tax cheats cheat on Schedule C. And so because of that, the IRS is very sensitive to those areas. You might have someone who, uh, let's say, decides they're going to uh, create a business on paper that's really not a business. They have no revenue. And they decide to put all these expenses in. They have a W-2 job. Right. And then all this loss, you know, ends up wiping out a portion of their W-2 income and they get a refund back. Well, that's typically how you're seeing tax cheats cheat on this stuff. So Cheaters. <laughs> so, so in other words, that's where you're seeing more exposure. Um, and also just, um, you know, more so now, IRS has ways of tracking revenue. <clears throat> so, for example, through... Uh, merchant card uh, through, you know, they get 1099, what are called 1099 Ks. Right. And they can see like, let's say, or a restaurant business, let's say they don't report cash at all. Right. Well, you know, some of the business is going to be cash, you know, so you have to think reasonably that you're going to have some of that, you know, maybe five, 10 percent. I, I mean, it's going to be lower now because everybody uses debit and credit cards, but uh, there's still some cash, you know, so to have none is suspect. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show today. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Um, you know, your kids are grown up. You're you're out of the house now. You just bought a new house. What's what's next on your agenda? Do you got any big plans for 2022? Are you coming out to visit me in Kansas City? You know, that's a thought. I want to wait till it gets warmer. But yeah, that's a thought. <laughs> I have a sprinter van. <laughs> <laughs>
No, it's and, not actually, um, it's actually not done yet. They've actually just taken off the bumper in 12 weeks. They said they'll be done in 14, though. <laughs> I've got hope. <laughs> They're working on it, mate, right? Hey, hey. Hello. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, I I know we're going to be taking some trips. Um, you know, Margie and I are going to uh, go to Europe and do some traveling. And then uh, also, um, yeah, we'll probably, you know, look at some more real estate this year. So. Are you going to look at some in Europe? No, I don't think I'm going to do that. Only because <laughs> there's a certain level of control factor. And I know that a number of people that um, in Europe, uh, the they're, they're more heavily tenant friendly than landlord friendly right. and so i'd kind of prefer to to be in areas that are more landlord friendly all right last words of wisdom for our audience let's say this um you never stop learning if you're in a business you never stop learning and if, if you get that you understand that you don't have um you don't have uh you know the people who say they know everything know nothing that's what i would tell you right there's always something to learn yeah, get get uh, tests. We have, we uh, we're gonna have to do another show with Mark. I've got so many more questions and so much sure. more knowledge that I've had for you. His time is valuable. His phone's going off. He's got another appointment to go to. <laughs> I appreciate you coming in to the show today. Thank you very much for I having me. It. It. All right, peace.